Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Scott Kersner. He is currently growing Innovation Leader, a media and events company focused on chief innovation officers, senior R&D execs, and entrepreneurs at large organizations who are responsible for making change happen. He's the author of several books, including his latest called Innovation Economy, and he has been a weekly columnist for the Boston Globe, writing articles about innovation, particularly in the Boston region, nearly since its founding. Scott, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. I'm so grateful to be here. Thanks. So you know a bit about storytelling for innovation. Well, I've been trying to make a living doing storytelling (laughs) around, initially a lot around startup innovation, because that's what I was gravitating to. And then in these last six or seven years around innovation and new products and R&D inside bigger, more established companies. Yeah, I love the diversity and range of your focus. And I've been following your column in the Boston Globe for a while now. I think you've had the column for, what, 20 years at this point? It's been a little more than 20 years, which it seems like it's gone by in a flash. It's amazing. But you write so prolifically for the Globe. I think you pub- seem to be publishing every few days fairly substantial articles, a lot about startup innovation, as well as, like you mentioned, enterprise innovation. And something I I just want to dig right into, your ability to create a narrative hook right from the title. At this point, I I think you're pretty much a master of that. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about how you get ideas for the column um, and how, how you try to frame those stories in a way that pulls people in and helps facilitate um, you know, energy and conversation around innovation? Well, it's such a good question. I mean, so the the hook in getting started, I feel like is always the most challenging thing, right? Anytime you have to create um, a storyboard or, or write something, uh, you know, a blog post or an article. And so I always just think, you know, after I've met people and done interviews and maybe visited places, Um, I always try to talk to people in my life about what I've seen and think about, well, what is actually interesting to them about this? You know, I've never aspired to be a science writer or a technical writer, um, you know, because I'm not that good and I'm not that detail oriented. So (laughs) I feel like, I feel like what I've learned is my strength is kind of, if you were explaining this to someone at a backyard barbecue, back when we had backyard barbecues, you know, what is the what is the piece of this that would really grab them? Um, and I tend to start with that and use that as a hook. And, um, you know, uh, so often it really can help to, to go places um, and see things happening for sure. Yeah, so it, it's funny. We come at this from two maybe different lenses because I, I am a scientific and technical writer. And and I, I love the I love that we've already kind of arrived at that juxtaposition between the really technical content and the more journalistic content. And and I think even really good technical writing really should do the same thing. If you can't explain it the way that you would at a barbecue, uh, I love that metaphor. Uh, you know. Even in, even highly technical information can mystify or create confusion if you don't uh, at least try to pursue a strong hook, pursue relatability. Yeah, I, I think about you know one of the one of my favorite stories because it could have been a science writing story and it could have also been an innovation story um, was a piece I wrote about kind of the creation of the Cambridge biotech cluster here uh, in Massachusetts. Mm. Um, And it was called How Cambridge Became the Life Sciences Capital. And I kind of felt like there was this moment, um, and I think it was in 1975 or 1976, when a debate sprang up in Cambridge over, should you be allowed to do scientific experiments using recombinant DNA technology. And there was a lot of fear that somehow, um, you know, these um, manipulated DNA strands would, you know, the lab rats from these labs would get out and um, carry viruses or that maybe the labs would be creating Frankenstein monsters. So a lot of people in Cambridge were freaking out about Harvard 
and MIT wanting to do these experiments with recombinant DNA. And one weekend, there was a I think the Harvard Crimson had written about this, but there was kind of an information fair or information tables that were set up in Kendall Square. And there was a pro table and a con table. And, you know, there were, I I think, students manning both of those tables. You know, yes, we should be allowed to do these experiments at our universities or no, um, not let's not do the experiments. Maybe we could do them in, you know, the desert of New Mexico, (laughs) you know, the same way we developed atomic bomb technology Mm. really far from people. Um, And to me, that felt like the hook, that moment of, you know, the summer of 76. And it was a it's a place that people in Boston know. And you can kind of imagine the students being really engaged and activated around this debate. And it it, I was able to catch up with one of the students who manned the con table, who was against the experiments happening in Cambridge. And lo and behold, he lives in California and he's a biotech entrepreneur now. (laughs) How funny. Did he say what that journey, you know, how his mind, mindset shifted over time? Well, yeah, he did. And, you know, he was kind of interested in really just the the dynamics of the debate and sort of really pushing the questions of what could go wrong here with these experiments, where should we do them? Um, but it just, you know, it's it's like you always are looking for that hook to start the story in an engaging way where people can can plug in and relate to it in some way. There's a place they know, or there's a tension and a debate happening. Um, and then this guy, I think his name is Scott Thatcher. He gave me the perfect ending because he now comes to Cambridge as a representative of this biotech startup looking for venture capital funding. And, you know, so that kind of let me end the story in a way to say, hey, this has become basically the world capital of life sciences now. And even mm-hmm. people who were not sure we should be doing this research in Cambridge now come here to, to try to raise money. So speaking of innovation ecosystems, that story is really about a regional rallying cry that gets created, a regional identity around innovation. And some regions are so have really perfected the, the art and science of their regional narrative around innovation, Boston, of course, um, and New England around biotech and, and, and biomedicine being one of them. Uh, do you have any... Do you, have you noticed um, other sort of regional innovation narratives or strategies that ecosystems have used to formulate um, and really help get everyone on board towards, you know, innovating together towards a shared vision? Well, I think the two Silicon Valley, obviously, since yeah. since uh, trade industry journalist, I think in the in the sixties coined the phrase Silicon Valley because he noticed there were a lot of chip makers that were growing there. Um, you know, Silicon Valley really has, I think, dominated that conversation over the last fifty or sixty years now. Um, but in twenty twenty one, you know, since we're all living in this crazy time, I think that. Austin and and my hometown of Miami have done a really interesting job of capitalizing on what feels like probably a temporary implosion of the Valley ecosystem because of COVID. Um, And there's a lot of narrative around, come to Texas, you know, Elon Musk Mm -hmm. has moved to Texas, Um, come to Miami, all these crypto investors have moved to Miami. The weather's great in both places. Um, you know, the politics are different than the politics in Silicon Valley, where, you know, I lived there uh, in 2005, 2006, 2007, just as the tech giants were really starting to colonize the city of San Francisco, you know, kind of move up from the suburbs of Palo Alto and Mountain View and Cupertino and come into the city. And there were lots of debates sparking up about how it was changing real estate prices in the city and displacing longtime residents. And do we want these giant Google buses, you know, sitting parked on our sidewalks at seven o'clock in the morning, um, you know, waiting to take people down to Genentech or down to Google? Um, So I definitely think the narrative right now, at least in the U.S., um, I haven't had a chance to travel overseas, you know, for 14, 15 months now. Um, The narrative is really around Austin and Miami, as I see it. Oh, interesting. I, I was actually wondering as I frame that question, how much 
there's been sort of a dissolving almost of regionality in this time. Like, are, are we going to see innovation ecosystems that are a little bit less place-based than we did before the pandemic? And I, I know for my startup in particular, we are headquartered in Cincinnati and really uh, so grateful to have been part of the Startup Cincy ecosystem. And, uh, and I was born and raised in Cincinnati, yet innovation and, and um, startup growth wasn't necessarily on the city's radar as I grew up there. And once I had finished grad school, it was all of a sudden this very supported, thriving space for entrepreneurship. Um, anyways, it's it's an interesting idea too, that maybe in light of the pandemic and in light of everyone working virtually, mm-hmm. I, I like to think we'll never lose our sense of place but I, I wonder well, I, if new, you know, if new ecosystems will be popping up. Yeah, I have thought a lot in the, over the last year about. So, are we going to say if you can hire and collaborate with people anywhere in the world, maybe right. constrained, a, tra- constrained a little bit by time zones, where you know it's it's very hard to collaborate with people in New Zealand or with Singapore if you're on the east coast of the United States, um, just from a scheduling live conversations <laughs> perspective. Yes. But that you could get really distributed ecosystems and say. Why does there need to be a you know marketing startup ecosystem in Cincinnati and in Boston and in New York and in LA? Isn't it just a global ecosystem? And I I do think some of that is happening, but I also just feel like there's going to be a really strong rebound. And I, I've seen it throughout the pandemic with startups who are just desperate to get their people back together in person around a whiteboard in the same room and just startups love that energy of collaboration that I just think is, you know, Zoom has its advantages and Mural and Moreau and all these great Red Pen, all these great collaboration tools um, are fantastic in some ways, but I don't think they capture the same energy of a room full of really smart people bouncing ideas off each other. And yeah, sometimes interrupting each other and yeah, sometimes it can be hard for an introvert to get a word in edgewise. I, I think there are drawbacks to in-person, but every entrepreneur I know, or most entrepreneurs I know, some percentage are bet- betting like, hey, the future is distributed. We don't care about office. I-, I was talking to people who were having meetings in their driveway during the pandemic around a whiteboard <laughs> or who had set up- Oh my gosh, yeah. You know, who had set up like little sitting areas in their backyard to meet with clients safely. And just, we're, we're so- social we humans that um, I just think a lot of the way we evaluate ideas and improve ideas tends to happen in in close proximity. Yeah, I I think I agree. And I I don't think that my startup would be where it is without that in person and those sort of startup hubs, physical hubs that, uh, that were spawned in my city. So let's talk about Innovation Leader and its founding and its mission. I would love to know, you know, obviously yours is an organization that very much prioritizes storytelling. So how did you see that as a need when you found it, when you co-founded Innovation Leader? And um, how have you kind of seen the, you know, industry respond? Well, I, I, I mean, the origin story is kind of based on me spending the early part of my career as a journalist covering a lot of the fast-growing, disruptive startups. I mean, I was writing for Fast Company and interviewing Jeff Bezos in the early days of Amazon. I was writing for um, a now-defunct print magazine called Darwin. I think I was writing for Darwin um, when I interviewed Reed Hastings in the first couple years of Netflix when they were still doing DVDs by mail. So we could talk a little bit about, you know, about those people and their storytelling skills if you want. Um, But, you know, so much of the narrative of the last 25 years, really, since the dot-com boom in the late 90s has been about startups that are changing the world. And I felt the thing that had been ignored was there's lots of companies with 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 people. P&G, Procter & Gamble would be an example there in Cincinnati or Starbucks in Seattle or Marriott, Mm -hmm. you know, um, in, uh, in Bethesda, I think, Bethesda, Maryland. Um, Disney in Southern California, there are lots of really big companies that do new stuff and they're constantly thinking about what is the customer going to want next? Where is the technology going? But no one was telling those stories. Like every once in a while, maybe the Wall Street Journal would do a story about 
you know, whatever it was, John Deere developing more automated tractors or the economist would do a story or, um, you know, the New York times would do a story, but it was very hit and miss. And sometimes they were looking for just stories of failure. Sometimes it felt like a press release where they were just touting, Mm. you know, Coca-Cola has this product called new Coke and the world is excited about it. Um, And we wanted to just tell those stories really consistently about the challenges of making new stuff happen inside these big companies and how you overcome them and how you build coalitions internally to to really change the way these companies work and, and the way it feels to work inside them. I love that so much. And it's interesting, um, the focus on entrepreneurship and also on, on brand innovation, especially in terms of how a consumer perceives brands today, there's so much more pressure from consumers to, you know, who, who are going to adopt and, and be more likely to, you know, be loyal to brands that, that they perceive as being innovative. And, um, where, whereas, you know, maybe, 10 or 15 years ago, it was all about the lean startup and, uh, and and how that's sort of at this point been adopted through entrepreneurship and and a lot, a lot of different, you know, changes in culture internally to try to sort of take on the best attributes of a startup within large enterprises. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, one of the interesting things about storytelling, right. Is that, um, once, someone owns a particular story in people's minds, it's very hard for the second player to come along and own that same story, right? You know, when Dollar Shave Club came along and really challenged P&G and their Gillette business and said, you know what, razors don't need to be this expensive. We're going to send them to you in a box at your house. Um, You know, when I go to my drugstore here in Boston, razors tend tend to be locked up you know, um, it's very hard to actually just go in in three minutes and buy a razor. You often need to find an employee. So, you know, Dollar Shave Club uh, uh, um, created the story about we can, you know, we can make this fun. You know, our marketing is going to be fun. It's going to be conversational. The product is going to be cheaper. It's going to be just as good as the brands that you know. And it was very hard for um, for P&G and for other companies in that sector to come along and try to compete and tell the story of like, oh yeah, we can also launch a subscription and we can also make this more convenient because Dollar Shave Club, you know, which was acquired by Unilever back in 2016, they they already owned that story. Yeah, exactly. It it actually reminds me a lot of the struggles we're hearing with disinformation too. And that's a different topic altogether, but similar in the sense that whoever says the piece of information or the whoever sort of sets the story first everyone else then has to play a reactive communication strategy around it. It's a lot harder to change the minds of those people who have been exposed to that original piece of information, even if it was false or um, not accurate. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's so true. But uh, that being said, back to disruptive innovation. (laughs) Um, so, So in terms of how big companies really have a lot um, a lot kind of working against them when it comes to a- adopting the dynamics of a startup and also winning public perception. And, and I think it's interesting to see the amount of marketing focus now on, on trying to reach consumers and set a tone of innovation for the brand. Whereas, uh, you know, there's sort of the shift, right? Like marketing tended to focus more on features and experience uh, and now we also see not just experience, but the experience of being part of a company that's innovative. And I think the companies also now with pressure from transparent, uh, to be more transparent, that's now also needing to be a core part of that brand innovation narrative is how uh, even though we're large, we're going to do things in an ethical way or we're going to share where we source and, and all of that. And that's another indication of a brand's innovativeness from the consumer's perspective now. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. And the, the other thing that I often think about is that, you know, companies don't realize that they're still recruiting people, whether it's interns or senior executives, based on their brand and how it's perceived, you know, how agile and 
cutting edge and innovative is your company perceived, right? And so I feel like that's a story that companies like Google and companies like Airbnb and companies like um, Automatic, the the company that makes WordPress, the, the blogging platform, have been really good at telling, you know, hey, we're going to give you the ability to work flexible hours, you know, pick whatever office you want to work in, move from, you know, move around from team to team. We're going to give you some time, you know, at Google, the whole 20% time um, policy of time to work on your own ideas and develop your own projects. Um, And it's very hard if you look at, you know, the top 10 companies in the Fortune 100, you know, Fortune 500. um, It's very hard for those companies to attract the best talent when their brand, their employment brand is still kind of so much about, um, you're going to go to a lot of meetings. Here's where you're going to be in the hierarchy. Here's what we're going to pay you. Here's what your title is going to be. Here's who manages you. Um, and we just want you to do this specific job description. Um, don't rock the boat, but you know, we'll let you when it, we'll let you know when it's time to promote you to the next job. Right. Right. There's a great, there's a great technique that our team um, found through the Wharton School of Business, and it's called the Brand Innovation Narrative Technique. And I'll link it in the show notes, but it's essentially like a five-step process that an enterprise can use to gauge, based on its employees' perception, um, how innovative that company is. And so you start essentially by asking, surveying, interviewing, talking with employees, asking them to rank and share how innovative the company is. And then you speak with executive leaders as well. And you listen for growth affirming versus growth denying rhetoric inside of their answers. And it gives you a really good sense of whether or not the company has a strong innovation narrative and are the people that that uh, work in that organization adopting that, believing in it? Are they hearing from leaders that it really, they really do believe in it and are growth affirming? Or are they actually sort of saying that they believe in innovation, but then their rhetoric is really more growth denying? So I'll link that because we just um, discovered it's a really good tool. If you're in a situation where you're noticing that, that there's a disconnect, you know, between where you want your brand to be perceived and where you may actually, what, what, what the culture might actually be expressing. Yeah, I you know it's funny. I haven't heard of that particular um, way approach of analyzing it. So I'm going to check out the link uh, in the chat uh, or in the show notes. Sorry, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I guess um, one thing we definitely have heard that companies do when they're serious is that sort of collection of longitudinal data about you know what does it feel like to work here. And often companies want to get away from the word innovation and they can sim- you can simply say do you feel like your ideas are valued is there a path mm-hmm. for I you expressing that. your ideas and prototyping your ideas and moving them forward um, and and I do think that a lot of companies you know they say the word innovation a lot and the CEO will say it in earnings calls and in interviews but are they really doing that kind of measurement about what does it feel like to work here do people think their ideas are valued um, do we have some systems and processes in place that let you develop ideas in a collaborative way. And the hardest thing about that cultural question is every company is going to have more smart people and more ideas than they really can take to market. And so, you know, do you develop a really thoughtful and sensitive way of saying, you know, Katie, this idea was great. We tested it with customers and let's just look at the data. And it seems like, you know, the market potential for this idea is not where we want it to be. And so, you know, we want you to come back, um, you know, we want you to come back with another great idea, um, Mm -hmm. you know, but but that's sort of, you know, the thing that venture capitalists do a thousand times a month is, you know, saying this idea is great, but we don't want to put our money behind it. I think big companies need to figure out a way to do that without demotivating people. That's a great point. Yes, because it is it is so demotivating when, uh, especially if your expectation and, and the thing that that you thrive on is seeing an idea come to life, and yet knowing that that really hard decisions have to get made um, and budgets are limited and and there's also different tolerance levels for risk at different organizations and in different industries. That's a beautiful point. Um, 
So I love your takeaway too, Scott, that really there's something to be learned from VCs and investors and the way that they sort of navigate the ups and downs of those decisions. Um, it might be helpful, not just for leaders in, in organizations to hear that, but also for the people who are sharing ideas to know, hey, we're going to treat this part of our work uh, a little bit like a startup. And we're going to be, like you said, agile and flexible and understand that we're here to come up with great ideas, but that doesn't mean that we're always, you know, we can't always invest in them, but we're, we're investing in you because you're here to share those ideas with us. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that one of the key tests here is, are you using the language and using the metaphors of the startup world, or are you really treating things like startups and like venture capitalists would? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I hear a lot of companies using the language of, well, you know, we we have a VC-like approach when we fund new ideas. And they mean that, you know, a committee of senior leaders at the company will get together and they'll listen to Scott's idea or Katie's idea, and they'll give it usually a thumbs down. Um, you know, one of the one of the issues with VC is that if you get a thumbs down from one firm, there are you know thousands of other firms whose doors you can knock on. In a corporation, that's not often true. There's a pretty finite mm-hmm. number of people who can fund an idea in a big company. Um, so that's one difference that I think is worth thinking through. And the other difference is VCs know. Um, in a given quarter, how much money are they supposed to put into startups, you know? And so they have a certain percentage of times that they are supposed to say yes. And I think a lot of big companies don't have that same ratio of, you know, do we know how much money we're trying to put into new ideas this quarter? And what does that mean in terms of the number of ideas we should, we should green light? Um, you know, no is a you know no is a word that people hear all the time in big companies, but you know how many times are they hearing yes? It's a really important ratio to think about. Yeah, absolutely, and create to create systems of accountability for that too. Uh, one strategy I've heard is to sequester funds specifically for that purpose, so that you're not uh, constantly, you know, trying to sort of pull from other budgets to defend and support new innovation ideas. Yeah. I mean, we've done a lot of research around innovation budgeting over the years and, you know, you want kind of a mix of like the consistent funding, but you also need a way to get ad hoc funding. If something is working really well, um, you see this in the startup world. If, if a startup starts to get traction and they realize that, you know, gee, if we pour another million dollars into marketing or another million dollars into recruiting right now, it's going to help us in a major way. In a lot of companies, you see that that sign of market traction and we're doing something the customer loves, but then you have to wait for the next annual budgeting cycle to say, we mm. need more money for this. And so that ability to have ad hoc, um, you know, kind of on-demand funding, if you really want to be agile and you really want to help the company um, double down on things that are working, y- you can't just rely on an annual budget cycle. Yeah, great point. You know, speaking of resource allocation too, what have you seen or heard inside of enterprises around storytelling, around innovation? What, what sorts of resources or systems of support have you seen um, in some of the companies that you've you know, been part of or, or, or toured or wrote about? I'm so glad you asked that question because, um, you know, the biggest thing we hear is that that we hear from former corporate innovators who basically say um, we didn't do enough. We didn't do enough internal storytelling. And that's one of the reasons that this initiative got shut down. Hmm. Um, you know, and, and so I've had that conversation more than once, which is, you know, in retrospect, we should have done more, not, not necessarily external storytelling and press releases, but just internal, um, explanations about how, what, why this initiative exists, you know, who we're trying to reach with this initiative, how you can be involved, um, and, and telling stories of success. So often it's, it's really an afterthought you know, the work of developing new stuff and testing emerging technologies, uh, you know, and, and bringing new things to market is really, um, you know, it just takes so much time and so much energy that storytelling is sometimes the last thing that people think about, and they don't really have a role on their team um, that's responsible for it. 
And yet it sounds as though that's often a common part of a failure narrative (laughs) in terms of why didn't this work? Um, Well, because it didn't get enough internal championship or traction or awareness. Um, And storytelling really could have played a part in the solution or perhaps been maybe led to a different result. Well, yeah. And and we have written about, you know, we have collected some examples of when companies do it well. Um, You know, there are a few examples of companies creating comic books as a way to tell the story of where they think their industry is going. Um, Lowe's Home Improvement did that a few years ago. I don't know if you saw any of those. I Um, did. I love the Lowe's. Yes. I think you can go to, is it Lowe's Innovation Labs or Lowe's Venture Labs, something like that. But you can see these sci-fi comics that visually show their, their view of what the stores and what shopping for home improvement will look like in the future. It's really cool. Yeah. And, you know, they did that really to, you know, as a risky way of communicating to the senior leaders, you know, here's why we're running all of these experiments in, um, you know, putting robots in the stores or thinking about how 3D printing might be used in our stores. Um, I ran into a guy from Bechtel, the giant construction and engineering company, who showed me a hardcover book that they had put together, like a literal coffee table book that they put together about a lot of the pilot tests um, that they had done out in the field with new technologies. And I was amazed by that because it was That's really brilliant. Just, yeah, it was really just a way to showcase, hey, here's what we've been doing um, in this group. And um, it wasn't a marketing piece at all. I think Bechtel had also done some, um, some work with comic books. We've seen other companies where they do um, you know, it can be anything. It can be a monthly meeting of people who want to be part of the innovation network. And you can do it on uh, Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever video platform you use. We've also seen people do video interviews, um, showcasing internal innovators. But I, I do think that storytelling has to be has to be part of these initiatives. Because there's always going to be a question, even in companies that are really successful, there's always going to be that point where things get stressful and the stock has a couple months of sliding down or um, you have a global pandemic that hurts your financial results. And, and how much do people understand what you've been accomplishing with your group? And you know, do they, do they really have a grasp? Could the senior leaders tell a concrete story about like, oh, that innovation group that Katie runs... They've done A, B, and C over the last year, and let's not defund them or let's not, you know, lay off half of their people. Yeah, exactly. Helping to create memorable, pithy storylines for leaders who are trying to make these budgetary decisions and directional decisions for their organizations. I love that example of the coffee table book. I've never heard that particular medium used for innovation storytelling in that way, but it's brilliant, right? So thinking outside of the PowerPoint, certainly trying to get creative and think about, I think too, maybe even that's a good reminder to observe and notice what types of content and what storylines resonate with you in your everyday life. What are those little moments uh, where something catches your eye? uh, And, you know, something like that, that coffee table book, giving that to stakeholders inside of the organization to say, oh, just take this home and put it on your coffee table. And on a Sunday morning, what are they going to do? <laughs> Flip through it. It's fat. Right. It's, it's brilliant. Um, right. Instead of, you know, at 2 p.m. after lunch and you're exhausted and you've made 20 other decisions, sit through a 10 minute PowerPoint um, again. <laughs> so yeah. I, I love I do, that. I do think that in most companies, uh, most big companies, the, the typical modes of communication are really boring and people feel like they're getting a fire hose of emails and PDFs that they should read and slide decks and articles on the internet. And so we do often say to corporate innovators, the more creative you can be um, with engaging people and telling stories and helping them understand what you're doing, the better, because you just want to stand out from all that other boring stuff that HR is sending out and, <laughs> you know, and the PR team is sending you. I don't know if you've ever heard of a company creating a board game, but that's another example that I've heard, um, creating a board game for employees to play. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Wow, this is wonderful. I, I know we're, our time is coming to a close and this has been such an energizing conversation, Scott. I am so grateful. Is there any other advice that you would like to lend to innovation leaders, managers, team members who are listening? 
Well, I mean, there's a lot, you know, I think your podcast, like it's been, it's such a great collection of advice on some of these issues. Um, I think that, you know, one thing I would say is that is repetition is important and saying the, you know, and talking to people about the long-term vision of why are we investing in innovation? Where are we hoping to get this company? How are we hoping to change the future? Um, is you, you have to be repetitive and people have to hear it uh, through a lot of different communication channels from a lot of different sources. Um, in big companies, there are a lot of different messages and it can feel like sometimes there's a strategy of the month and people just wait for that strategy of the month or the message of the month to pass them by without really plugging into it. And so I think when it comes to storytelling around innovation, finding these phrases that work. Um, I was thinking about how Katrina Lake at Stitch Fix for a long time at that company, you know, she was talking about the passion around personalization and making everybody feel like they had a personal shopper when they went to the Stitch Fix website and when they got their Stitch Fix box in the mail. I think about another entrepreneur who grew a really great company, um, Helen Grainer from iRobot, talking over and over again, almost every time I would interview her, talking about having robots that could do the dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks <laughs> that people don't want to do. And so finding those catchphrases um, like dull, dirty, and dangerous to explain, here's, here's why we exist, here's what we're trying to achieve, and, and being repetitious about them in a lot of different communication channels, it is pretty important. And I guess that's one message I would want to touch on. You know, I've done almost a hundred episodes and interviews for this podcast, and not once has someone mentioned the importance of repetition. And I'm so glad you brought it up. It's a really, uh, it's really uncomfortable, and it feels strange to many people to be repetitive. And it almost feels like it's anti-innovation <laughs> because you feel like you need to always be thinking of the next thing. And yet, that is that that's the key to effective leadership around all of this. So. Um, I'll never forget, I met a really famous innovation keynote speaker and I watched his keynote talk one day and I had him on the podcast another day and I had coffee with him another day and I watched another uh, keynote that he gave to a live audience the next day. And in those four settings, I think I heard the same stories 20 times, <laughs> but it was really effective. I, I can repeat all of those stories now and I have a very clear sense of where he came from and what what his vision for, for innovation means. And I would, uh, would love to work for someone like that, who has a, a clarity of mind and and can share it over time, um, and, and you know, again, that that feels so uncomfortable to us individually and perhaps as leaders, but it really is effective. It's just, it's so important. I'm glad you brought it up. And, and if you think about all kinds of social change movements too, you really need that repetition to to get change to happen over a course of years. And I think you alluded to something which which people get distracted by, which is, you know, you look at your social media feed, you look at the recommended podcasts on Spotify, and there's so much stuff out there and you feel like, oh, we have to have a new message or have a new thing every week. But but yeah, I do think repetition can be a winning strategy and coming at the same message from lots of different angles until it really sinks in and people can say, oh, I know what this company stands for, or I know what this group inside this company stands for and why they exist. So I'm glad that, I'm glad that the message of repetition hasn't been a redundant message. In your <laughs> <podcast>. <laughs> it doesn't, but it should be now moving forward. <laughs> Scott, this has been such a delight. Thank you for making time with us today. I really had fun. Thanks for having me. You can find Scott Kersner on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and you can also follow at InnoLead. Go to innovationleader.com. Check out the incredible articles that Scott publishes on the Boston Globe. And, um, and I can't wait till the next time we can chat. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.